We'll now take up the um, next case on our docket, Barnett versus the State of Florida Department of Financial Services. <clears throat> May it please the court. Lori Waldman Ross and Jack McCluskey on behalf of the petitioner fathers. On the night of September 27, 2010, N Natasha Del White's estranged husband surreptitiously entered her home, murdering Natasha, four of her children, and injuring a fifth. The fathers of those children sued the Department of Children and Families for failure to protect them in the face of Mr. Dell's long history of domestic violence. The fathers contend that the claims at issue, and there are six claims at issue under the statute, arose out of different incidents and occurrences for purposes of the amounts recoverable against DCF without filing a claims bill. For this, we look at the statute in its totality and the language that was used in the statute. First of all, Paragraph 1, this statute, while usually referred to as the sovereign immunity statute, was not exactly a sovereign immunity statute. Sovereign immunity existed at common law, and without an express waiver, it was the law of the land. Sovereign immunity was waived initially in 1969, which led to this act in 1973. In 1973, the name of this act was the Tort Claims Act. Now, it borrowed two separate provisions from the Federal Tort Claim Act. The first is certain language in subsection 1, which was derived from 28 U.S.C. section 1346B. And that is the language which says that you are permitted to recover damages in tort for money damages for injury or loss of property, personal injury or death caused by the negligent or wrongful act or omission. That came out of the Federal Tort Claim Act. And you're allowed to recover those to such an extent as if a private person would be liable to the claimant in accordance with the general laws of the state. It says may be prosecuted subject to the limitations. It then, in subsection five of the statute, set forth Another general principle, the state and its agency shall be liable for tort claims in the same manner and to the extent as a private individual, except, now there, the, the, the first exception is straight out of the Federal Tort Claim Act, section 2674. And that first sentence says, you shall not be able to recover prejudgment interest or punitive damages. You then come to language which is unique to the Florida legislature. And the Florida legislature did not, in creating these limitations, use the same language as it did in the creation of liability for the state in paragraph one. It used language relating to arising from the same incident or occurrence. There is a per person, per claim limitation, and then there's an aggregation of all claims or judgments, but they have to arise out of the same incident or occurrence. So at the time this case arose, DFS intervened in an ongoing negligence suit to file a deck action. And it said the limitation had to be a set amount no matter what. And it defined the term claim, incident, or occurrence as relating to the underlying cause of action, which is negligence. It defined all of those terms the exact same way. We have indicated to the court, and we've given you the textual support for it, as well as the history of an existing legislative scheme and sub 10, which was in existence at the time, to show you that the legislature could not have meant that. First, the, the fact that the, that the limitations did not say 
uh, a limitation for negligent in negligence or wrongful act or occurrence means that the legislature must have meant something different when it dealt with the uh, limitations in sub five. But the use of the term claim yes. is similar to the use in the first sentence, right? The use of the term claim um, is not. Well, isn't the first sentence limited to tort claim, right? No, it says, it says actions at law against the state or any of its agencies or subdivisions to recover damages in tort for money damages. Doesn't use the word I'm claim. talking about subsection five. Okay, now if you're talking about subsection five. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, the word, the word tort claims is the first, the recovery. So when it refers back to claim, isn't it referring to the tort claim? Uh, not, not necessarily. What, why? It, it, because it would be referring, I'm sorry. Let me correct myself. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's referring to the tort claim, but that is different language from the limited, from the broad language authorizing the cause of action to actions for negligence or, and or wrongful acts. Well, I don't, I don't know that I disagree with that, but if we're referring to tort claim and then it says the claim or judgment, yada, 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 arising out of the incident or occurrence, isn't the arising out of referring to the claim or judgment? Yes, it is arising out of the claim of judgment, but again, we are talking about what the same means in that context. Well, I understand that, but isn't the focus of what it's arising out of the same being the, the claim? The claim. But, but the word claim has a different meaning from incident or occurrence. The ordinary meaning of a claim is a right of action or a demand for damages. Right. That's, it's got a completely different meaning. So then if, if we're looking at the claim, the act of negligence, um, as you've just described it and defined it, and I, I tend to agree with that definition, um, arising out of the same incidents or not, isn't our focus then on what that claim is and what arises out of that negligence? Well, you've, you've added the word negligence in there. Well, and that's, and, and but we know it's tort. We know it's tort. Because it can't be breach of contract, we've Absolutely. said that. Absolutely, but here's the basis of our disagreement. And, okay? and your claim is negligence, so. Uh, our claim is definitely negligence. So. But here is the source of our disagreement. Nobody on, on our side of the room, including the companion case, says that sovereign immunity doesn't apply. Everybody agrees that sovereign immunity applies. Nobody on our side of the room takes the position that there are no limitations. The question is, in this instance, whether each shot constituted, it was an injury causing event, the, the, was, a separate, was a separate incident. The question's the focus. I think everyone agrees. Exactly. But I guess what I'm asking is, if, if, if we're reading it as the claim or judgment arising out of the same incident or occurrence, isn't the focus on the claim and the negligence to see what happens, what stems, arises out of, derives from, results from that? Yes, except it cannot just be solely the negligence because you have to look at the underlying facts every single time. If you look at the cases, but if, if yes. arising out of is the link between Occurrence, that is correct. Same incident occurrence with the claim. So that it, it's to, actually it's claims or judgments. Right. It's claims that which is caused judgments. by. I mean, it's it's caused by. What we say is these type of cases, and Mr. Rosenthal will address this more in more detail because he's done the analysis of the parallel statutes, which went went into to effect. These type of cases that we're talking about is a narrow subset of negligence. These are what we call derivative liability as opposed to pure vicarious liability. Well, so uh, let, let, I, I know b both sides talk about um, the case of Zamora. Um, yes. Do you think that's a correct reading of the statute by the fourth DCA? I don't know. I will tell you that there are several different ways that the courts have gotten to the same place. Zamora says you look and see what the underlying elements of the cause of action are, assuming you have two different claims. You look at the underlying evidence. You see the elements of the cause of action. You see whether there's an overlap or not. Isn't Zamora unique, though, as opposed to a lot of the other cases you talk about? Because that is one where there truly are two independent causes of action. But, uh, 
it, you can have two independent causes of action in the context of a civil rights case, which is the original acts of discrimination, the acts of retaliation. Those are recognized to be separate causes of action. But isn't that true of any negligence case? Let's say it's a, it's a, a, a some sort of municipal hospital of some sort that has municipal liability, um, where there's independent claims of negligence for Act One by Doctor X and Act Two by Nurse Y, um, well, first, that results in different injuries. Municipalities have different types of sovereign immunity. Sorry, but, but a state-owned hospital. No, I'll, I'll, I'll accept the right. I'll accept the analysis. Yes, there are there are differences in time. There are differences in place, but. To say that you only look at the underlying cause of action reads out of the statute the original language in subsection 1, which authorizes claims for negligence or wrongful acts or occurrences, because if the legislature wanted to limit the, the amount recoverable, they would have used that exact same language in subsection 5. Instead, they borrowed from insurance law Ms. Ross, may I ask you a question, of though? Of course. If we just look at Section 5, not the yes. other section, where you talk about arising out of the same incident or occurrence, you keep talking about, um, you keep using the word separate, which is a different adjective. So can you address for me why we should read the statute the way that you're asking us to interpret it when it, it doesn't say arising out of uh, a separate uh, incident or occurrence, because to me the issue becomes the use of the word same, which is an adjective that has a particular meaning. I agree with you wholeheartedly, and let me just say that the actual language is arising out of the same acts or occurrence. What we are talking about, I'm not talking about separate I was trying to address how the analysis has gone forward. What we are talking about in our case is about the fact that these are different incidents and occurrences. Each shot constituted a different injury occurring event as to each child. And we have six different claims which had six injury producing events that affected but each how, person. But how is that a reasonable interpretation when uh, the use of the word same incident. It, I could understand that if you had a, um, a temporal, uh, if you had a, a situation where there were six incidents and it occurred at different times. But once the person enters the home and the acts occur, mm -hmm. how is that not the same occurrence or the same incident because it's, it's happening under the same, I would say the same umbrella, really? Because it's a, it's a temporal event. Each shot is a temporal event, even if it's short in time. By this, I resort to, necessarily, to the three cases that were decided with regard to insurance coverage. Now, recognizing insurance coverage is a different issue, nevertheless, the factual scenarios in all three cases involve the interpretation of incident or occurrence. If you look at the two cases that preceded Coicos, and that's the ALI case and uh, the 50 CA case, um, I've, I've forgotten the name at the moment, but both of those cases, both of those cases involved separate shots, which were defined but as occurrences. You, I, I understand that those cases say that in terms of the insurance context, but here we're still talking about a sovereign immunity, which is, as we all know, a different animal, and uh, the sovereign has to consent to being sued. And here the sovereign consented to being sued or being liable, but they limited their liability. They did limit their liability, but the question is what that limitation was. And that's the legal issue before you. So if I could get back to the analysis that was in the underlying coverage cases, because the, the original two cases that were decided, McQuake, that's the other case. McQuake involved shotgun blasts that injured police officers when they went to uh, arrest someone. And the shotgun blasts specifically occurred within a very, very, very short period of time between one another. The court said there's a different meaning of the term occurrence, occurrence, and occurrence means 
each particular injury producing act. Well, but how is that consistent with the way we would ordinarily understand that term? I mean, when I hear the word occurrence or I hear incident, I think about an aggregation of acts that amount to something larger. Um, and it seems like here what you're trying to do is to get us to pare it down to this, this, the injury that's caused by a, a particular discrete act that's part of this larger uh, event, occurrence, incident. And so it just doesn't, it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, strike me as what you're suggesting is really consistent with the way we would ordinarily understand that term when we're using it in conversation. We wouldn't refer to, to, this, to the tragic event at the house that evening um, as a series of occurrences. It was, a, it was a, one terrible occurrence, one terrible incident um, uh, that involved uh, multiple uh, harms and, and, and multiple tragedies. But it still would, it would just not uh, it, it suit the ordinary uh, use of that term uh, to, to say, well, we've got several occurrences going on there. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't seem to me. What am I missing there about the way we okay. ordinarily use that term? Well, those terms? I looked at dictionaries to find that for, 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 and, and, I, and I came up with, and the Rumbaugh case really tried to make the distinction between what is an incident and what is an occurrence. And an incident is an action which is a separate unit of experience, which would apply to each one of the six shootings. An occurrence is an occur, it's defined as an incident or event or the happening of the incident. So it comports exactly with the ordinary meaning of the statute. Well, let, me, let me give you a hypothetical and, and see how, sure. see how you, your theory applies to this. Um, say uh, there's a van being driven by, that's owned by a governmental entity and uh, being driven negligently um, by um, uh, uh, an employee of the, the governmental entity. Um, now, we know if that van crashes and people are hurt inside the van, multiple people are hurt. One occurrence. One occurrence, okay. I think everybody would agree about that. Right. Okay, say, that, say it happens this way. Say, because of the negligence of the driver, the driver veers off the road uh, uh, or, or, and hits the pedestrian, comes back in and injuring the pedestrian, uh, comes back in, hits uh, one car, injuring someone in that car, and then veers further and hits another car, uh, injuring somebody else in that car. That's a harder situation. And well, that, I thought it might be. No, That's why I, I asked I it. Know. I know that. And, and we've gone through tons of different scenarios and tons of different hypotheticals. I think in that case, it's if, if it would be a continuum of the driver driving on, there is a good argument that it's one occurrence. But there's also an argument that it's more than well, one. Well, okay, but to the extent that there's a good argument that that's one occurrence, I'm having trouble understanding why there is not a good argument here uh, that there is one occurrence. Because what is, there you've got the negligence that's mm -hmm. propelling this whole sequence of events. Here we have, in this tragic case, the murderous intent of, uh, of uh, the, the man who committed these, these crimes. And that is propelling this whole terrible sequence of events. So in some ways, it seems mm -hmm. to me that the, uh, the, the analogy is not perfect, I understand, because in one case it's, it's driven by negligence, in the other case it's okay. driven by an int intentional uh, uh, purpose. Um, but it seems to me that the analogy is not, not too far well, off. Let's look at, first of all, that's always the case in derivative liability cases, because what you have is the negligence of an entity which allows the intentional wrongdoing of a third party, a negligent supervision claim, a negligent security claim. It's the, the foreseeable acts of the, the wrongdoer that actually causes the injury itself, but the negligence is what propels it and is responsible well, for it me, on behalf. If, That's the nature of. If, if I may just change the hypothetical a little bit, and mm -hmm. the driver, let's say the driver of the van that is transporting whoever for the school board yes. is known to have, by the school board, uh, for quite some time to have emotional issues. Mm -hmm. And on that particular day, he takes the van, he's driving a high speed, at a rate of rate, at rate speed, 
and he is communicating back with the school board without mm -hmm. asking them to come back and he says no I'm going to kill everyone in this van and he does just that goes into a ditch goes up against the three now we have an intentional, intentional act on his part mm -hmm. but the death all occurred at the same time there wasn't this single trigger pulling thing that you and that's one occur that's one so, occurrence and we have given a lot of different examples of that a bomb going off what, a bomb what, going what, off why in is stadium. that why is that one occurrence that is one occurrence because if he veers into a crowd of people that's one incident or occurrence he it's the act of the the injury producing act no matter how many people he hits it's, well, the injury you, producing act is driving that car are you, are you focusing on whose act are you focusing on i am focusing on the intentional tortfeasors act and that was the focus usually the negligence and the intentional tortfeasors act are different and that's the basis of a uh, of a um, derivative liability claim. so miss ross is your is your uh, argument based on it sort of sounds a little bit like on the temporal nature of it because the tortfeasor who's in the car who's driving it's one incident where they hit the the tree in that in that hypothetical and everyone dies is it different than if he hits the uh, the tree but then he runs out he survives mm -hmm. and then he does something else I would take that into account, yes, and that's where I think the Pierce case went off on. Pierce being the separation, there were two arrests, but they happened for, for violating the same blue laws, but they happened within three months of each other. What I'm saying to you is negligence can't be the sole basis of determining what is an incident or occurrence. It can be part of it. But you can also take into account the evidence, the temper, time, place, manner of the events. So it's a factual issue? It's a factual issue for the judge. So if I could have one, I know I'm over time. If I could ask, <coughs> well, if well, I could what, have what, one what if you got a jury? Why don't you answer the question? Sure, what, what if it's a jury? No, no, no. It should never be a jury issue. That's. It's got to be. Usually juries determine factual issues, right? It, yes, juries usually determine factual issues, but this has to do with the interpretation and application of the statute to the facts. So it's legal. That is a legal determination by the court, and I think it would square, this type of analysis would square and would fit into 90.105, where a judge makes determination of preliminary issues prior to a trial. It would fit into that provision of the evidence rule in figuring out how this is done. Um, but in terms of giving you guidance, those are the things I've looked at. Okay, we have burned up your rebuttal time, but I'll let you have two minutes anyway. Thank you very much. Good morning, and if it pleases the court, I'm Peter Dunbar with the Dean Mead Law Firm, appearing on behalf of the Department of uh, Financial Services. I'm joined by my colleagues, Brittany Finkbinder <laughs> and Mark Dunbar. Um, succinctly and to the point, and on behalf of the department, I would respectfully submit that the Force DCA got this right. It presents a concise and accurate summary dealing with some of the cases and questions that you've asked. The opinion is consistent with the doctrine of sovereign immunity, and it strictly construes the language at issue in this matter, and it is consistent, that construction is consistent with previous opinions from the second, third, and fifth DCAs that, reference, that are referenced in their opinion where there are multiple claimants <coughs> and a single tortious act. Now, petitioner questions what is meant by incident or occurrence. That's part of what the dialogue has been about that we find in subsection five of 76828. Believing that it lacks clarity and suggests that there are some dictionary definitions, <coughs> Justice Kennedy, that might help us. They, we refer to uh, the Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the English Oxford, Oxford Dictionary to uh, analyze these terms in isolation. Doing so, however, I think overlooks and ignores the language from the legislature that's found in subsection one that Justice Luck made reference to a moment ago. Subsection one clearly identifies what an incident or occurrence is. And I quote in part from that subsection that makes that identification as follows. The state 
hereby waive sovereign immunity for liability for torts caused by the negligence or wrongful act or omission of any employee of the agency. That is the meaning of incident and occurrence that the Fourth District Court of Opinion, the uh, Fourth District Court of Appeals opinion identifies. It is the tort that's committed by the state that is the incident or occurrence that the legislature has waived sovereign immunity for. It is the incident or occurrence, the tort committed by the state, that has now been recognized by the second, third, fourth, and fifth DCAs each time the question has come to the appellate courts. And it is the incident or occurrence that is the tort of the state that has just been referred to by petitioner's counsel and petitioner has referred to 12 different times in the brief and reply brief. Mr. Dunbar, if there are separate uh, negligent acts by the state or a governmental entity, uh, those are different, not the same incidences or occurrence. Justice Poston, I would absolutely agree with that, and I believe that's exactly the way the Fourth Court has presented it here and in their opinion. And so um, if there are more or there's a dispute about whether there were more, would that be a factual issue for the jury? Whether there was more than one negligent yes. act, yes, yes, I okay. believe that would be correct. So if, if a complaint alleged two separate and independent just happen to be consolidated in the same case, negligent acts by DCF in this case, then the aggregate could be applied to each negligent act. You would agree with that? Justice Luck, I do agree with that as well. And actually, um, the Fourth District Court of Appeals deals with the other prior cases where this has occurred. So Zamora, you agree with Zamora? Yes. OK. Yes. And really, for us, all we need to do is to look at this complaint to see if it alleges separate negligent acts. And if it does not, then the single aggregate would apply. That's, that's. Um, candidly, uh, Justice Luck, I think where the court should be is to look at the question that's been presented here. Um, I wouldn't disagree with you that. Well, we have to answer the question, but we also have to do something with the case. Yes. Um, so with regard to the case, you agree that, let me put it this way. If I'm a DCA trying to apply this rule, I would look at the complaint as framing whether there are two separate and independent causes of action, correct? That's correct. Okay. I would agree with you. Yes, sir. Um, I also want to, um, in dealing with legislative interpretation, I want to uh, point out, um, as Ms. Ross did, that this was enacted originally in 1973. And the legislature has returned to this section of the law on multiple occasions since that time, both before and after the appellate courts have spoken to the issue, and on five separate occasions since the facts in this case occurred yet they have made no changes to those parts of the section that relate to the meaning of incident or occurrence that's found in subsection five, and that plain meaning remains <coughs> a negligent and wrongful act or omission by the state, the tort described in subsection one. And when the legislature re reenacts a statute, as it has done here on several occasions, this court, has found that the legislature is presumed to be acquainted with the prior court precedent, and the legislature is deemed to have approved that judicial interpretation. And I would refer you to this court's decision and opinion in Malou versus Security National Insurance that was issued in 2005. Um, respectfully in this matter, uh, there is no new meaning to be ascribed to the words that have been selected by the legislature in the waiver of sovereign immunity, particularly in light of the previous appellate court decisions and the subsequent legislative attention uh, to section 76828 and the changes made there. Let me turn to the certified question uh, from the fourth that discusses the words and their meaning, and I want to suggests that it presents them much differently than the petitioner here. First, the court acknowledges that the meaning of incident or occurrence is the tort that's been committed by the state. And as a prerequisite to the certified question, the fourth court goes on to explain that it has narrowly construed the uh, language in the manner in the same way that three prior courts have done 
and strictly construed the language of the legislature waiving sovereign immunity of the state. I'm sorry Mr. to Dunbar, you. Can I go um, ahead? Go ahead. Ask you just to to help me out. And this is, I mean, it, 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 you, you may be absolutely correct. I, in the, in the saying that we look at the negligent acts, and it's the negligent act that constitutes either an incident or occurrence, um, so that if there are multiple negligent acts, then there are multiple limits of liability. So that, that may be correct. If it is, I'm just curious. You, you answered Justice Luck's question by saying, yes, you look at the complaint to see if it alleged multiple acts, which this one does here. And I would suggest, I mean, in my experience, I believe that most derivative liability cases would have multiple different, I mean, you know, they, they didn't have a security guard, they didn't have adequate lighting, the locks weren't good. So they're, they're generally the derivative cases also have multiple acts of negligence. But as, as a practical matter, would it be enough to just say, okay, there are five acts of negligence that are alleged here, so that's, you know, $200,000 times five, a million dollars. Or do you have to, would you have to link it to, I mean, so, so you could have one act, but if they don't demonstrate that and plead that that individual act constituted a tort, I mean, that there, there was causation. You have to link causation to that individual act before you could say that the immunity was separate for that one. I mean, if you, I would think that if you're going to try to prove causation by linking all of the acts, I, what would that do with respect to the limit of liability? Do you understand the question? Because I, I don't want a result well, that's going to be so confusing that nobody knows how to apply it. If you, I mean, because does, he, does that make sense or do I need to explain Maybe a little better? You, you could re-ask, but let me give you this initial response in the context. In other words, is it enough to say, um, here are five acts, and in the aggregate, they caused the injury, so we have a tort, and, and therefore, and now it's a million dollars because there are five acts. Or do you have to say, here's Act 1, and it caused the injury, not looking at anything else. Here's Act 2, it caused an injury, and they have to prove causation with respect to each one individually in order to double or multiply the limit of liability. Justice Lawson, I'm not sure I agree with the premise. Let me try it this way. Uh, again, the, the act, the incident or occurrence, is the tort. And if I go back to the fourth DCA's opinion, no, it's, it says it would be the breach of, it would be the the breach of duty, right? It would be the breach of duty. But to have a tort, you'd have to show that it caused the injury. I'm sorry? I said it, that would be a breach of duty. But to be a tort, you'd have to show that that breach of duty caused the injury, all four elements of a cause of action and negligence. Yes, but it was the act of negligence that is the tort. Okay. Counsel, can I ask you a question? The, so if the focus is on the, is on the conduct of the government entity as opposed to the, the actual person who's Third inflicting parties. the harm, um, if, you had a, if you had a case where the issue was negligent hiring, and an employee went in over the course of 10 months, went into 10 different homes once a month and committed intentional torts, and then someone sued you know, the government entity for having hired that person. Would you consider that one incident or occurrence? As you posed the question, I think that you described for me the tort being the negligent hiring. And so, well, that would be the theory of liability. I mean, that's what it would be based on in a case like that, right? Well, I'm going to get to damages and liability in just a minute, but the incident or occurrence, which is where, where we determine how that compensation occurs, begins and is the incident occurrence of the tort. Of the, of the negligent hiring. Of the negligent hiring. And so wouldn't it be, which would mean that you would consider all 10 of those things to be the same for, for, you would say that the, applying the statute that all, all of those people's claims would have to be added together for purposes of the Yes, cap. and that would be the aggregation under subsection does, 5 that would occur. And doesn't that really go against sort of the, the way a normal speaker or user of the language would understand an incident or occurrence? I rely on what, one, I think it's important that 
um, the strict construction apply and that you are relying on the words and the intent expressed by the legislature. And as I um, remarked in my opening, it is the tort. Now, could the legislature change it? Could you rewrite it? The legislature has it certainly within their prerogative to do it, as I mentioned, multiple times. As circumstances change, as the state modernizes, we've raised the limits, we've done other things here. That's what the legislature does. That's part of, um, uh, well, let me try it this way, if I could. Um, the, the court, in asking the question, the fourth court, also acknowledges that a broader and more liberal interpretation or construction could, by inference or implication, expand the current waiver of sovereign immunity uh, to acts beyond the state to third parties, which is the essence of what you're asking. In other words, the, way, the question here should be, are we intending that the waiver of sovereign immunity enacted by the legislature be more liberally construed? Yeah, but that, that assumes that there's a, a two reasonable readings or there's some sort of ambiguity in reading it. Um, do we, I, I guess the question that Justice Muniz is asking, and, and maybe he's not, but I'm asking is, is there two readings? Isn't there one reasonable reading of what this is based on the language and structure of, of the statute? And if there is, then we don't get to liberal or, or, or strict construction. Justice Luck, I absolutely agree with you. I think that what's being asked by the petitioners is that you do a more liberal reading, and I think that would be not consistent with this court's... Well, let me ask you this. Do you agree that there's one reasonable reading of the statute? There is, and it is that the tort is the act or occurrence. And around that, then, how is the compensation to occur? There is an individual amount and a you cap? Keep, you keep saying tort. tort yeah. But you know, a tort it is, you don't have a tort until the injury occurs. So you're talking right. about the breach of duty. Right. Yes, and the, the injury... Is that, am I correct? Yes. Yes. May, I, may I ask a question regarding um, the issue here is uh, a claim. Is it, in the Zamora case, there, it was, there were two claims, one for age discrimination and one for retaliation. And the fourth DCA, um, in its analysis, seemed to suggest that because each claim, age discrimination and <coughs> retaliation, um, required different proofs, i.e. they had different elements that needed to be proven, that therefore that's why they were different claims. Here are there different claims that require different levels of proof or different elements. And this is going to be also for Ms. Ross so she can be prepared. I don't think so, Your Honor. Um, I, I, the, the fourth court has characterized it as a single act of negligence that resulted in damages. That's the way it comes to this court in the question that they presented. And I, I want to go to this court's opinion in America. Oh, well, I, but before we do, I, I want to clear this up because you said that it's not ambiguous, but, but and, and, and it's not ambiguous in many cases because in many, if not most cases, the, um, the act that constitutes the breach is also the immediate cause of the injury. So there's no ambiguity in that circumstance. But in a derivative case where the act that causes the breach isn't the immediate cause, I, I don't know why it's not reasonable to say that the, most people would think of the incident as the immediate cause. I, I would, I mean, as Justice Muniz sort of indicated in his question, y you would think of the incident here as the tragic incident that happened in the home. You wouldn't think of it as the act of breach, the failure to investigate over time. I mean, you wouldn't, I wouldn't think so. Why isn't that at least ambiguous when you're talking about a derivative claim where the act that constitutes the breach of duty is not the same as the immediate cause of the injury? To the extent that there may be a lack of clarity or ambiguity, I believe that this court has said that it is appropriate, and I would cite American Home Assurance versus. So you, you think it, it could it could be ambiguous in that respect? No, I think what I was acknowledging was if you find it to be that way, okay. then I believe because to me it's clear, and I think that the other prior appellate court decisions and the Fourth District Court of Appeals have analyzed it correctly and reached the correct, correct conclusion. <clears throat> but if you find it not to be clear or subject to reasonable interpretation, 
this court in the prior opinion of America Home, American Home Assurance has um, uh, suggested uh, the following uh, this way. Only the legislature has the authority to enact a general law that waives the state's sovereign immunity. And the court went on further to say, any waiver of sovereign immunity must be clear and unequivocal. In interpreting such waivers of sovereign immunity, it must be strictly construed. Moreover, a waiver will not be found as a product of inference or implication. And by the way, the court went on to say in that opinion, it recognized the three major policy principles and considerations that underpin sovereign immunity and its waiver. And the first is to preserve the uh, constitutional principle of separation of powers. Next is the protection of the public treasury. And third is to protect the orderly administration of government. And on behalf of the Department of Financial Services, I would submit that the decision in American Home Assurance is the correct way to appropriately address the question in this issue that you have before you to today and preserves the principles that underpin sovereign immunity and its waiver. The American Home Assurance decision recognizes the strict construction of the waiver of sovereign immunity that's found in the law enacted by the legislature. It preserves the policies that underpin that doctrine. And it does leave uh, the injured party or parties with appropriate remedy for compensation. And that would be the claims bill process, as the Fourth District Court of Appeals has explained. It is a process <clears throat> that leaves the appropriation power with the legislative branch where it can be exercised in a manner that both protects the public treasury and the orderly administration of government, but at the same time, it provides an orderly process for the compensation of victims that might aggregate uh, above the $200,000 limit here. In the process, I have per personally participated <laughs> firsthand for more than a decade in the claims bill process, both as a voting member of the House of Representatives and as the Governor's General Counsel and Director of Legislative Affairs. Um, from my personal perspective, it is a process that I have seen work, uh, and it is a process that I have seen fairly compensate those parties that are injured. Um, as I conclude, let me uh, um, briefly return to the petitioner's brief and observe that basically what's being asked is that the question you've been presented with be rewritten. And that once you look at that rewritten question, you basically rewrite the law um, that waives sovereign immunity. Respectfully, I think the petitioner is wrong in that regard. It is um, an extension of sovereign immunity is a legislative function. It should not be done by ignoring the separation of powers <coughs> doctrine. A strict construction of the waiver language provided by the legislature by this court preserves the constitutional um, principle of separation of powers. It appropriately protects the public treasury. It ensures the orderly administration of government, but it still provides for the um, remedy that allows victims to be compensated for the claims through the claims bill process. Um, it is the conclusion that the fourth DCA reached, and respectfully, it is the conclusion I think should be appropriately reached by this court. Um, I thank you for your time and attention this morning, and if there are no further questions, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Let me address each question as it arose. Um, Justice Lagoa, there is, n there is different proof as to each shot and a different duty owed to each child. So if you apply the Zamora analysis, you would not only have an individual claim by each child, but you would also have separate proof as to what happened to each child. That's why um, the fact that there was existing law in effect, there was also Pearson effect at the time that, the, that all of these decisions being made. And Pierce treated two separate incidents that were simply separated by time. Are there different facts as to DCF or the same as to all the children? 
As to all of the children, there are different facts because they each relate to each child separately. Yes, he broke into the house. Yes, he murdered the mother. Yes, he uh, injured each child, but he injured but, each but child. But the act of negligence, though, is the failure to investigate, ultimately, which, which is common to all of them. That is true in part. But if you're talking about the breach of duty, A, breach of duty is owed separately to each child. B, until an injury occur, it doesn't matter what the negligence is. It's the injury producing event that triggers the negligence in the first case. That's what's different. And I also wanted to ask your, answer your question as to, do you just look at the complaint? Complaints can be amended. In fact, our complaint can be amended. The case is being ongoing. You can't turn incidents or occurrences, can't turn on clever pleading. It just can't. We need guidance from this court as to what the term same incident or occurrence means. We're not asking the court to change the law. We're asking the court to interpret this very specific language in the statute. And finally, with regard to the, the fourth district, the way they pose the question to this court, they put, they put the, uh, the horse before the cart. They said, and they were correct, that there are very few cases dealing with multiple injuries arising from the same event. But the whole issue in this case is, was it the same incident or occurrence? So you may ultimately get to the same conclusion, but the analysis is flawed. And we ask the court for guidance in terms of interpreting that, which means you take into account- Your, your time's expired. Thank you. Thank you for the extra time. Thank you. We'll now move to the final case on today's docket, uh, Gutenberg versus the 